God, you are a good and loving Father. It is you I always can rely. And when I need to talk in prayer, I seek you. I will always find, always find your kindness, patience, your my gentle love in Jesus, your grace and understanding. Hello, this is Gretchen Keskes, and I'd like to welcome you to another edition of Keep Hope Alive. This week, I was thinking about how God can use us, and I wrote this little thing that said, we don't have to be, quote unquote, all that for God to use us. But when we do go through all that, and we look to Jesus Christ as our Savior, and we experience his healing and love in our lives, he can definitely use that. And the truth is, we don't have to go through all that. We can also, we can always um, serve the Lord and be of use to the Lord. But it does say in Romans 5, 3, 5, we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance and endurance produces character and character produces hope and hope does not put us to shame. Because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. So hallelujah for trials. <laughs> and it's, you know, last week we were talking about uh, storing our treasures in heaven. And uh, I had a little heavenly check, so to speak, this week that really put that to the test in my life. And that is my computer crashed. And when this happened, my heart just kind of fell to the floor. Is I'm a writer, I have all my songs I've written, blogs, uh, a beginning of a book, a lot of things. And at this time, I didn't know if it was backed up properly. And so I had this sense of, you know, fear and loss and dread. And uh, it made me stop and think about, you know, am I storing my treasures in heaven or am I storing them here on earth? What would happen if I really did lose all that or lose precious photographs? Would I be okay? And the answer is yes, I would be okay. Because at the end of this life, we all do lose. We will lose the things that are precious to us, whether it be, you know, th this life or our health or our looks. And that's when I just, I just embraced Jesus and I just said, thank you. I'm so thankful for your hope in my life and that assurance that at the end of this life, I am going to be with you for eternity. Well, today we're going to be talking about fear. You know, President Franklin D. Roosevelt said, there is nothing to fear but fear itself. And you know, that really is a very wise and profound statement because the truth is fear is extremely destructive. But if you look in our world today, our culture, our government, the media, it seems that we are continually being filled with fear. It's almost being promoted. And this can be really tough and, you know, I, my heart especially goes out to so many children right now. You know, I was watching a, a video of a mom talking about her, her child. She was talking to a school board and she was talking about her child's mask. And she was very upset over all this. And she said, do you know that my little girl didn't want to go to school without her mask? She didn't want anyone to see her face. I mean, how did that develop? That's what fear does. It gets a hold of us, and then it's almost like these little tentacles. It goes off into all kinds of places in our life that we would have never imagined. And this actually happened to me. And so I'm going to share right now a little bit of my testimony and how Jesus Christ 
completely delivered me from the paralyzing fear that I was in. I'm not exactly sure why I ended up being in so much fear, which actually turned into some anxiety type disorders, but I think some of it was grounded in my childhood. You know, I I speak about my father, who I love dearly. My father was an amazing, kind, loving man. He, as I said in my other podcast, he did write the book, I'm Okay, You're Okay. He was a wonderful uh, military man. He he was the chief psychiatrist of the whole Navy Department in Washington, D.C. He was a Pearl Harbor veteran. He was kind, compassionate, uh, just a wonderful person. But he had some of his own trauma in his childhood, which I learned later. And the truth is, I don't think that that was ever dealt with very well. And when my parents' book became very successful, for whatever reason, he started turning to alcohol. And I think that happens with a lot of people who care for others. Sometimes they just don't take the time to care for themselves. But so my childhood started off very just picture perfect, sweet, wonderful, just a wonderful mom who created so many, one, you know, just a beautiful house and just, they were both just very, they, they had a lot of warm silliness in them. So it was always happy. And my dad was a pilot. He had a plane. He had model railroads. He would build us playhouses. We had a big neighborhood for, full of children. So it was great up until about age seven or eight. And that's when their book came out. And that's, you know, this is how I track it back. This is when my dad started drinking and I knew something was going on in our home. We didn't really talk about it, but something had changed. And then my dad got, uh, unfortunately, he got a DUI and that was, I know it was devastating to him and it was in all the papers. And I just know this kind of fairy tale life really changed. And during this time, I started turning to food as a young girl. I, I, I would uh, come home from school and just get something, you know, sugary, sit in front of the TV and watch something funny uh, and laugh and just kind of get lost in that because my life was becoming very painful because at school, I went to a private school. It wasn't a really big school, but they had seen uh, the stories in the papers. So kids would tease me about that. And then I was gaining weight and then I would get teased about that. And even some of the adults weren't very nice. And so my life was just becoming this big feeling like I was swimming in this big bowl of shame and humiliation. And then some other things happened later on. Um, It's such a, I have such a long testimony that I, I won't go into everything right now. But when I hit puberty, I started becoming interested in boys. Uh, I lost all the weight. By this time, I think my parents' life had calmed down a little bit. I mean, we, they had just kind of carried on like everything was normal. This thing that happened with my dad, it was almost like it was, was sweet, swept under the rug. Fortunately, I will say for my dad, he, he did uh, accept Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. And towards the end of his life, he, he was definitely uh, spirit-filled. He loved church. And, and, and they, they stayed together for 40 years and they had a wonderful marriage. So we did have a rough patch there. But um, Jesus Christ, as always, was our Savior. So, but back to the story, I, I lost the weight and we were, my sister showed horses and we were around a lot of older men and they just started, you know, paying me attention. And I guess I sort of liked the attention because I had had so much pain in school. Uh, and then some things happened that were inappropriate for a, a girl of, you know, 13 years old. And I'll just leave it at that. But it was just, it wasn't, it wasn't right. I have two daughters and I would be (laughs) very mad if I caught older men um, treating them like, like I was treated. So anyway, around age 14 or 15, I, I left that world and I just focused in on uh, school 
And I was very uh, popular. I I'd got myself, I was a very attractive uh, young girl, teenager, and I got a lot of attention uh, from, you know, boys. And I really was kind of fitting in with the popular group. But deep down, I had never dealt with the things that happened in my childhood, the things that happened in puberty, all these things. And now it's like, I just wanted to be this new person. In many ways, I was. It was almost like that person didn't exist. It was like, just know me now. You don't need to know all that. And I don't exactly know why this happened, but around age 17, 18, I started just becoming, having these panic attacks. I'm kind of thinking it very well may started because I had all this shame and humiliation in my life that I'd never dealt with. And that really kind of was at the core of these panic attacks. I would be afraid I was going to do something that would be embarrassing or that I would bring some kind of a shame on my family, like do something really stupid and outrageous. And I would just, these fears would just be growing in me. And we all know that fear is the, the tool of the enemy. And I had that confirmed this week. I, I, in doing some of my studying to do this podcast, I had looked at uh, the testimony of this former Satan worshiper who was now a Christian. And he confirmed what I always thought, that definitely fear is Satan's tool. Because it, that is how he can totally destroy a life. And that's what was happening to me because the fear, it just seemed to grow and the fear would paralyze me. And before you know it, I became afraid of the fear. And I think that's what a lot of uh, neurotic uh, or anxiety disorders are. You, you become so paralyzed and afraid of the fear. And so I would start doing these uh comforting, I guess, at first rituals of, you know, if I was afraid I was going to burn the house down, I would check the stove before I went out. But then I'd go be getting in my car and all of a sudden it'd be like, wait, did I really check it? And I would allow myself to go back again. And then that kept happening. I didn't know what was happening, but I kept giving into the fear and going, oh, I'll go check again. And before you know it, I was doubting my own mind and this became extremely paralyzing in my life. I didn't know what was going on with me, but my life became a life of bondage. I was imprisoned by panic attacks, the fear of panic attacks, and then this obsessive compulsive disorder. Uh, I got to where I would be driving the car and all of a sudden I thought I would think, what if I hit somebody in the road? I better go back and check. And it sounds so crazy, but that's what fear does. And it's one of the reasons I have such a concern with what is going on today with kids. You know, we talk so much about the physical illnesses, but people have no idea. When you get trapped in a mental illness, when you get trapped in that kind of paralyzing, deep, dark fear, you, you can't enjoy life anymore. There used to be this song, it was called, it was by the group Loggins and Messina, and I used to lay in our, my parents' pool and sing it in my head. It was always, it, was, it's, it said, you know, all I need is some peace, peace of mind. It went like that, give me some peace, peace of mind. And I used to sing that again and again, because that, that, that's what I wanted. I didn't have peace and I was suffering a lot. It was a torturous life. You stop enjoying anything. And I literally became very depressed and I never laughed. And, um, you know, I would go up in my parents' library and I would read, I would look at all their books. They had a huge library and they had wonderful, I mean, it was, they had all kinds of books, but I would pick up every book, uh, different self-help books. And even one time I looked in my dad's psychiatric journal because I was trying to figure out what was wrong with me. I was so afraid that 
I didn't even want to talk to my parents about it because I mean, I was afraid they would put me away or something. I didn't know what was wrong. I thought I was going nuts. And so I read my dad's psychiatric journal. And after reading the symptoms that I had, I did, it seemed to point to this obsessive compulsive disorder. But in a way, reading it was made me scared too, because then it said, oh, it can do this or you can do that. And all of a sudden, all these new fears started coming into my mind. And uh, during this time, I actually managed to get a job uh, at a really popular, fun restaurant. It's funny because even though I had all these horrible fears and my life was unmanageable, I still wanted to live. I wanted the things that a young woman wants. I wanted to be pretty and go out and meet people. And so I would try to do that, you know, nails dug in. But I got this job as a hostess and I would look really pretty. It take me about five hours to get ready. And that's no lie, just to going through all my rituals and all my things. And I was so particular about everything because I was just trying to keep this fear in check. So I'd get to the restaurant and I, I might even start start enjoying myself a little bit. But then I, you know, then I was always fighting the fear. And one time I sat this family down and I we did this little spiel where we said, you know, welcome to the restaurant and these are our specials and enjoy your meal and here's your menus. And I did that. I seated them. And then I said the whole thing over again. It's almost like my mind was so paralyzed by all the stuff going on. I didn't even realize I had just said it. And the lady's like, what's wrong with you? You just said that. And it just made me feel so horrible. I was just so embarrassed and so ashamed and just so fearful. And I just, my life was just, it was hopeless. I didn't know what I was going to do. I really had no hope for my future at all. I thought, so anyway, um, during this time, I just, it just got worse and worse. And that's what happens with fear. It gets worse and worse, but there is a good ending to the story. So I'm getting to it. One night I was taking a a shower uh, and one afternoon I was taking a shower and, uh, I just had a horrible panic attack in the shower. Just I literally thought I was going out of my mind and I just went in my room and I just started crying and crying. And I think my mom heard me and, you know, she, um, my mom, I I talked about my mom last uh, episode, but, you know, she, she did, even though my parents were kind of during those years, we went to church. I definitely didn't know Jesus, but it was more of a kind of a social church. But there were a lot of traditions and wonderful things that I had gotten from that in my childhood. But I didn't know scripture well. I didn't, and I certainly didn't know Jesus as my personal Lord and Savior. But that night, my mom came in my room, and she she knew I was really troubled, and I hadn't been talking about it. And she knew I needed some help, more help than any person could give me. And that's when she shared with me uh, Matthew eleven twenty eight through 30, where Jesus says, Come to me, all who are weary and heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in spirit, and you will find rest for your souls. And that just penetrated my heart deeply. I I think in that moment, it was the first time that I felt understood. And that was part of my illness that I just felt like nobody would understand me. And I just felt in that moment that Jesus did. And I think after that, I, I might have fallen asleep, but I know this. After that, I couldn't get enough of the Bible. And I was absolutely astonished at how specifically Scripture spoke to what I was struggling with. And the greatest verse for me in my healing is the verse that says, it's First John 4.18, There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. And that verse really did change my life because I know it was his love and his love alone 
that was the key to my healing. And I remember sometimes I would start getting panicked or something would happen where I would want to go back and check or I'd want to go back into the rituals. I'd want to go back to that dark place. And I would just picture myself embraced in Jesus's large hands. Sometimes I would go to sleep that way, just picturing myself, just just embraced by his love. And, and, you know, I used to grind my teeth at night. That's how bad my anxiety was. The dentist was like, what's, you, you grind your teeth. Yeah, I did grind my teeth. My, my, my anxiety was horrible. And uh, so it's the perfect love of Jesus. If anybody ever asked me the key to my healing, I would say that. And that's why I think it's so important for when people are str- suffering or struggling we don't throw anything heavy at them. We don't, we don't, you know, do the uh, fire and brimstone. That's not going to change them. It's the love and grace of Jesus, because that's where the changing begins. It's not the other way around. I mean, that time can come where we we understand the full uh, word of God, but his love is just beautiful. And I actually wrote a song about it. It's called Your Perfect Love. And it goes, um, You may search the world over, but you'll never find a love so perfect as found in Jesus Christ. One embrace of it will ease and heal a troubled mind, lift up your burdens, bring comfort all the time. There's only one source of perfection that brings salvation and redemption. Your perfect love is the remedy. It takes the fear away completely. Your perfect love, so unbelievable, it does the impossible your perfect love. And I thank Jesus for his perfect love and also his perfect word. There are so many scriptures in the Bible that I just could not believe spoke to me so powerfully. Another one of those is in 2 Timothy 1.7, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. That one really spoke to me, and I just held on to that so dearly. Or Philippians 4, 6, don't be anxious in anything, but with everything, through prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, make your requests known to God, and the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will dwell in your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Yes, he did give me back that peace, that peace that I longed for. And I will tell you that the peace I received is the greatest gift ever. Sometimes I forget because my life has such a solid peace in it now. I mean, yeah, I have, sometimes I go through things where I will have a a, a painful day or difficult things happen, but that peace that I didn't have, I have had that since the day that my heart started changing, and that was back in the early 80s. That peace has stayed with me. This peace means so much to me that I wrote a song about it on my first album. I talk about my songs a lot, but they really are my heart. I I share my deepest uh, experiences in song, and this song is called The Prince of Peace. And in the middle of the song, I quote this scripture, which is one of my favorites from John 14, 26 to 27. Peace, my peace, I leave with you. My peace, I give unto you, not as the world gives, I give unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Wow, that is so powerful. And it's just so true. I just sometimes I marvel that the Bible was written, you know, all those years ago. And it, there's nothing that captures the spirit that, that the things that we go through, even in this life today, the world does not give us peace. Like we talked about in the last episode, it, it's fleeting. And I will say in all this healing, and as I have stepped out into ministry to share what Jesus Christ has done, There have no doubt been spiritual battles in my life, and Satan will continue to attack. 
And uh, it's so important to remember that and that we wear that full armor of God. And I will say in all these years of my healing, I have never struggled so much with this fear issue as during this pandemic and keeping that in a realistic place. You know, some fear or concern uh, is okay for our life. Like, for instance, I'll quickly share this story. Uh, I used to be a runner when I was in my early 20s, and I used to run like five miles a day. And I came upon this car. I was on this busy road near our street, and he was at a stop sign. And I thought it was just, I didn't know if I should go around the car or what. Anyway, the guy kind of stops, talks to me, and he says, uh, can you show me how to get to Arden Fair? It was a shopping mall. And I'm like, oh, sure. You just take the street down take a ride on Howe Avenue. And then the guy goes, get in the car. And I was like, what? I just totally. And then I realized that he meant it. And I jetted across this very busy boulevard. I think God was looking out for me because there was no cars. And we lived on a circle and there was a circle behind our house. I ran up our circle. Their car took off around the other circle and I ran really fast to our my parents' house. Fortunately, I had a key. I put the key in the door, and, or as I was running, I saw their car coming up. I got in the house. I was, you know, that fear got me to their house. So thank goodness for that fear. And I will just end that story by saying this is really creepy. But I used to work in news after that some years later. And there was a trial for a ser serial killer. His name was Charles Ng. And I never, I didn't even know that at the time. But after learning about that, and in the whole description of the car, the two men, one Asian man, one white man, a Honda in Sacramento in the early 80s, that was the guy in the car. And what they did to women, they would take them up to the foothills and do just the most horrendous things. And so I just have to thank you. Thank the Lord that that I didn't have that fate. But anyway, that's an example of fear that, you know, so, so it's not like. We have to numb away all the fear, get rid of all the fear. Or even when I used to take acting classes, uh, my acting teacher would say, you know, your nerves are good. They, they, they help with your performance. But the kind of fear that is so destructive is the kind of fear that gets deep into our soul and causes us to shut down our lives. It causes us to avoid relationships. Is It causes us to avoid stepping out. Uh, is it, it causes us to um, start thinking suspiciously about thing or um, things or imagining things. You know, there's a verse in this whole idea of spiritual warfare, Second uh, Corinthians ten five, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. I mean, that is powerful. And that's the kind of fear we're talking about. And it's just amazing how the, how the Bible speaks directly to that imaginations, because I used to do that. I used to imagine people were um, saying things about me and, and all kinds of things. You can make up all kinds of things in your mind. And so um, it is definitely, it's a spiritual battle, but it's one in the love of Jesus. Always remember that if you're experiencing profound fear, Always focus on the love of Jesus. I mean, read scripture, pray, but his love, it really is the answer to fear. So if you are experiencing fear in your life and it's hurting your life, it's causing you to not live the life you fo fully hope to. I mean, that was the thing for me. I had so many hopes and desires but that fear was always holding me back. And that's what the enemy of God wants for us. He doesn't want us to live that abundant life. He doesn't want us to go forward. And, you know, I can get very sad about my young life because there were many, many years that I was just paralyzed in fear and I could have been doing so many things. But I have seen God restore my life. And that's what he promises to do. And that's what he will do for you. But if you're at a place where you're you're uncertain, I mean, definitely there's nothing wrong with seeking counseling. I mean, I'm thankful that my counseling came 
in the word of God, even though I lived <laughs> with a psychiatrist and, and uh, that there's, you know, there are people definitely can give help. And there are even medications, but I will say this, I didn't ever take any medication. Uh, and I'm not against that. I would never say, don't do that. That's definitely between you and your doctor. But in my case, my healing was complete. I mean, as far as that paralyzing fear and the anxiety disorders that I had, I mean, sure, through my many years of the Christian walk, I've had ups and downs, but I went from a life that was totally paralyzed, locked in the house to one where I've traveled all over by myself, going live on television, singing in front of hundreds of people, doing all kinds of things I would have never dreamed of before. And I just love sharing. I just love giving God the glory for what he's done because he's allowed me to really enjoy my life. And to be honest, the only time I don't enjoy my life, my only regrets since I became a Christian are when I haven't trusted God. And sometimes those are very painful times, but I have to remember that God promises to restore those times and I'm holding on to that promise. So I'll just tell you, if you are suffering or struggling with fear or you know anxiety or worry and you want to be free from that bondage, it really does start with the love of Jesus Christ. Uh, knowing his word, get into the word, uh, surrender your life to him. Uh, I mean, talk to someone in ministry, a pastor, but there's no one I trust more than Jesus Christ. He knows me. He loves me. He loves you. And he has an amazing life for you. So wherever you are in life, I know that there's hope for you if you are experiencing these kind of paralyzing fears. And that's found in the love of Jesus Christ. So I'll leave it here today, and I will just end with this scripture in John 16:33. I, Jesus, have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. Thank you so much, and God bless you. Keep hope alive in me.